Hasanabi Corporate. I don't even know what that is. All where, right. Where am I? I can't see myself. There I am. All right. Boom. Ladies and gentlemen, Chelsea Manning, American hero in the building. Hey, how's it going? Hey, thanks for having me again. Can you hear me? Of course. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, uh, what are you doing in Los Angeles? Uh, so yeah, I'm just kind of like hanging out on the West Coast. I was in San Diego. Uh, I went to uh, like December oh, nights in San Diego. And Almost then, turned off the OBS. Real yeah, I saw that <laughs> while I was trying to fix the. Uh, then I uh, uh, then I'm just uh, sort of like in Los Angeles, like doing business stuff. B business. So I see I'm dressed up in my school clothes. So yeah. Business stuff. What kind of business? Can you say? Can you elaborate? Yeah, yeah. It's just like it's just like business stuff. Like in terms of like you know, like what do I do now in terms of like speaking engagements and things like that. Like okay. future stuff. So um, but yeah, uh, generally it's just uh, I'm also like doing like my security consulting and things. I have clients on the West Coast as well. So just uh, just business business stuff. Just hell yeah. Just keep um, speaking of business, uh, let me run the top of the hour ad break real quick. So. We are uh, deep in the pocket of talking about uh, Israel-Palestine. So I see. Which is uh, certainly, I it's assume... There's some developments today as well. Yeah, the, Israel is uh, is continuing its bombing campaign. Israel is also... We have an expansion um, into the southern the southern part of the Gaza Strip. Yes. Uh, here it is. This is the latest from the New York Times. The Israel-Hamas war. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, you you're... You have a lot of experience in this sort of thing. Urban combat operations. It's nasty. It yeah. is the like the it is a casualty generator on a scale that we have, you know, very little uh little ability to comprehend. Like the just immense especially especially whenever you have like constant airstrikes, constant bombardment. I mean, you know, like the the door to door like V, you know, vehicle, like house to house type, type stuff can be ugly. But, you know, whenever you're like using heavy mun munitions in any kind of major city, uh, it's it, and, and, you know, the the kind of heavy mission munitions that uh, that, um, you know, that can be produced, you know, for for like high high explosive things, you know, for high, you know, <laughs> so your, your plastic explosive, your plastic explosives and your, uh, your like JDAM, your, your like yeah. JDAM type of Would you like it just, there's no comprehension. It's, it's like the. It's it's hard to comprehend like how devastating this is, but you see like mangled buildings, like the, the actual photos, not the Adobe generated like uh, fake ones. Yeah. Um. So let me ask you something. Would you say that uh, Israel has uh, the capabilities of making uh, targeted striking, precise striking, and also even engaging in like door to door? Uh, operations well, they have they have been engaging in door-to-door -door operations and they have been using um you know they have armored vehicles they're not they're they're pretty standard they're like a little out of date like in terms of like comparison to like the stuff that was used in, in iraq and afghanistan um uh, that the u.s used i think they're upgrading they're like upgrading it to like have vehicle slats and things like that um but yeah like it's uh i would say that it's very the problem is is that it, because Israel has essentially had its eyes on Gaza for decades and decades and decades, the amount of information that they know, how, like, like, is down. It's it's extremely granular. Like they know where people live. They know where where things are. Where, where things are. It wasn't like the United States coming in and like trying to figure it all out. Like they know the specifics uh, and and they sort of like have really uh like really good intelligence. The problem is, is I think that. That intelligence shifts and changes as soon as you start to like conduct a, such a massive operation. Do you also you do. feel like the fact that they have all of this precise information and also the targeting capabilities, uh, and and their lack of interest in utilizing that kind of shows the the real like gives the game away? Um, because it seems like if you have the precise targeting capabilities, if you uh, with your munitions, with your weapons, uh, one example I use is the the first building that they. Uh, blew up uh, in in Khan Yunus, uh, where they where they blew up just the fourth floor. They said it was a high priority uh, Hamas uh, leadership. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. But anyway, uh, but the fact that they have those uh, capabilities and and do not exercise trigger discipline, if you will, kind of gives the game away that this is not about eradicating Hamas at all, and instead about. Uh, widespread ethnic cleansing and ethnic displacement that's occurring, which is something that uh, isn't uh, a, a uh, activist-backed talking point rather than uh, genuine Holocaust and, and genocide scholars openly showcasing 
are openly stating that this has the workings of ethnic cleansing, like right. all of the workings of it. Right. So I think that one of the the things that you see with um with this with this particular conflict in in in, in particular, and Kaya is uh, yeah, she's very, a, she's very she's out she's of very control. excited today. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that you sort of see with the, the with this kind of conflict is that um, they are where they could use restraint, they don't, and where you know, and I think that this is one of the things that sort of seen even senior American State Department officials have sort of ident- have have recognized things that like senior Department of Defense officials like 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 even though. Even though is even though Israel's relationship with the United States has historically over the last like 40 50 years been like you know they they've been in, in strict alignment um it was like they, there was some hesi- there was some hesitancy I think like in the se- like after a couple of weeks you know uh, of of sort of like how they were conducting the operations and sort of like well, the the rhetoric that they 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 were using like like in, internationally like not necessarily domestically but the the sort of rhetoric that they were using and like the the actions that they were that they were they were they were, that they were con- taking in terms of like you know because this concept in warfare of you know that um, you know there's a closet what's seen concept of reciprocity which is you know that whenever you know you 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 have a you you have a proportional sort of response to the attack and you know obviously you know the 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 uh, the the attacks on October seventh were uh, were a, a tr- sort of triggering point and were sort of a, a, a really abhorrent sort of attack that you saw that that, that was that that really. Um, even though Israel sort of had the intelligence ability to collect, uh, they, they had collected the intelligence to be able to, um, at least based on the New York Times reporting, you know, to sort of like identify that this was a possibility. It really did shock them into this like, yeah. in, into this like sudden like nine yeah, eleven uh, like, style nine eleven style response. And you know, we, you know, and and they've been reacting sort of in a way that that is not always as as logical and rational as a, a, a as somebody who's like strategically thinking as like a military operator. They think, they're thinking more of uh, more in the way of like revenge, as in like and yeah. You know, I think the rhetoric is is very like we need to you know like like especially whenever people they're un- whenever they're more unfiltered it is very sort of vengeful language amalek uh wipe gaza i mean yeah, you glass, have you, you know, yeah glass, glass gaza yeah. we're not hitting it hard enough which is by the way consistent with the the population uh the polling numbers as well obviously this is something we've looked at now what i find really interesting is um on december 2nd two days ago the u.s department of defense uh, the the Secretary of Defense Lloyd J Austin the third yes. delivered remarks at the Reagan National Defense Forum, and in those remarks he actually had uh, a lot of criticisms. A lot of uh, I mean these guys are always going to be very restrained in the language that yeah. they use, especially when it comes to regional cooperation with our allies. And especially it's the staunchest ally in the region. Yeah, especially one as important as Israel. As I've said, Israel is basically a state. And not like a shitty state, but like a cool one that America really cares about. Um, so, uh, of course, his his uh, his statements here are very "quote unquote" damning. But what we have been doing behind the scenes, or sometimes very openly, is still offering full support uh, to Israel, uh, sending munitions. Fi- you know. Uh, uh, Shaking yeah, the couch cushions, usual. yeah, shaking the couch cushions to find extra J dams or, or bunker busters, not J dams. Uh, there's uh, bu- a shortage of. Yeah, like there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of conflicts geopolitically lately that have sort of caused a, a shortage of weaponry uh, and ammunition, like uh, globally, like it, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, yeah. etc. So, um, yeah, like the, the and I think that's one of the, that's another reason why I think that you know, there's only so many there's an economics to warfare, and that is that. There is only so many precision missiles. There's only so many precision weapons that you can that you can develop. And as one of the things that we saw in the early stages of 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 um, the war in uh, Ukraine was uh, that you know there were there, there was a lot of use of, of precision uh, weapons and, and even shelling. And then that sort of went down to like more like just sort of like nineteen like tens era like trench warfare style like uh warfare and i'm and one of the concerns that i have with with sort of like the 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 use of this ma- of this many pre- precision munitions is that you run out of them there's only so many that you can produce and then you end up with you know uh i'm, I'm very hesitant to use use the term that uh because like the, what the, dumb dumb yeah, weapons yeah exactly d- dumb weapons but like yeah like they're, artillery but they're they're you know they're conventional you know they have no they have uh like basically you shoot it in the general direction you hope that it hits yeah 
Um, which, by the way, Israel has been using as well. Like they they've yeah. been using artillery. And they've been I, using I tanks as they run out. Like that's what you have to use. I mean, yeah. you know, Even even in Iraq and Afghanistan, we we, we you know we definitely uh, in the latter parts we had to use you know uh, more more simple uh, l- l- less precision weapons, right? Okay. Um. So. But what I was going to talk about, like I said, is, is uh, you know, you have Lloyd Austin saying civilians are the center of gravity in the Gaza war. I've heard that terminology before. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you're <laughs> for those of you who don't know, what would you how would you describe yourself? Because like I, I kind of just jumped into it. Right. Uh, Chelsea Manning is a Hassan Abihead first and foremost, of course. But, you know, she's done some. She, I, and, and a former Twitch streamer. I streamed for. Yes. But uh, she's also at the uh, I mean, or was at the center of of a lot of. Uh, uh, I yeah, guess so controversy. I some, so I have some experience, uh, specifically with Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I deployed to Iraq in 2010, and uh, some events happened in which a lot of material ended up in the public domain. Uh, um, you know, uh, like the, helicopters the, shooting at. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of material that I that that was released, and uh, but I also like I just had a I was an intelligence analyst, and I worked in this position, and I worked in this role. So I, I've seen sort of both sides of this now. So I've I've been on the I've been in the position of being a uh, you know wor- working for the Department of Defense in the uh, you know essentially the occupying power of uh, of of a war of a wartime environment. And I've also you know been uh, sort of uh, th- in my later years, I've, I've sort of been more of like of a humanitarian activist and, and sort of like engaging in more distantly, like almost. Uh, I, I don't consider myself like a journalist journalists because like I there there's there are very good journalists who do this very very professionally like I, I'm more of like a, a somebody who like for security purpose uh, for just sort of like intellectual purposes I just keep track of like combat operations and how they're and how they're done um and so I've uh, now I speak and write uh, about sort of like how technology specifically like tools like artificial intelligence machine learning deep neural nets um and uh, predict you know and how this and, and how these sort of technologies have pervade uh you know, have become more pervasive in our lives. Like social media has adopted some of these technologies, and I sort of speak on these matters a lot um, after after being released uh, from prison uh, a few years ago. So yeah, I jumped thank, around a little bit. But, thank you for your service. Uh, yeah. Um, so, just the just, reason why the reason why I wanted to hear your perspective on this is because, like you said, civilians being at the gra- like at the center of gravity in the in the uh, the the ethnic cleansing campaign in Gaza is something that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a statement that you've heard before, yeah, and and may have even had uh, you know specific uh, hands on uh, like worked on both sides of it and, and had like specific hands on information on um, yeah. adjusting it to rules of engagement, uh, even with all of its uh, 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 I guess um, extremities, even if, even when like rules of engagement are are. Uh, uh, or the American military goes far beyond the uh, modus operandi, the rules of engagement, the, or the standard operating principles that they put forward. Um, what would you rate Israel's uh, casualty to high priority target? Uh, what would you rate Israel's uh, casualty per high priority target assassinations in comparison to like even American military operations. Yeah, so I I, do, I don't know what their internal sort of mechanisms are or how they or how they make those kinds of, kinds of calculations, but um, you know, we we like I would say that in the 20 in the in the late 20 in the late 2000s, um, there were certainly some level of metrics that were that, that that would be looked at and sort of like, you know, whether it's a go or no go for 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 a targeted operation. Targeted operation can either be like missiles it can be bombing it can be uh like an aerial strike it can be an airstrike it can be a um it, you know it, it can be like you know uh door kicking you know it can be like door you know kick uh yeah. just spe- special operations guys kicking a door and um, or getting spooked and calling yeah. in air support yeah exactly into and a so nearby there village was like, there was like you know because of the, the the scale of the the united states military's operations but they also like the 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 size of a city like Baghdad and the size of a city like Mosul um you know like it they, there was a there was a bit more time to sort of like look at sort of the what what the weight weights and metrics are for uh for doing this kind of thing in the latter part of of, of the war and uh yeah they, like it would, t- it would probably be a 24 48 72 hour sort of time frame that you would that you would know like what, what kind of operation that you're, you're going to do I don't know how they're doing it but it does, you know, like it certainly it certainly looks like 
rather than doing a tar- ra- rather than doing a targeted operation where you're weighing like, okay, are we going to send in guys on the ground? Are we going to do a sort of boots on the ground mission? Are we gonna air? Uh, are we gonna airstrike a position? Like, what is the casual? Like, what is the um, the 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 what do you call it? Collateral damage sort of yeah. assessment, right? You know, like I've always been hesitant to use that phrase collateral damage because it, it, it really is just a way of being able to justify in your brain like, oh yeah, like you know, this is the metric for ha- whether or not, you know, innocent people around it could be killed or whatever. Um, and I think that, you know, th- those, like they're obviously using heavy, really heavy munitions yeah. in a in a very densely populated area. This is like, like the the level of density, like uh, this is like Solder City, like which we did we you know in in Eastern Baghdad in the late 2010s and or, or the late 2000s early 2010s, you know we were conducting operations and we, we you know we tended not to do airstrikes in that kind of vicinity because you know like the 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 amount of collateral damage that could be expected in in a modern city in a in a modern densely pop- populated area like that was was just too high. You know, so yeah. you'd see more, you know, you would see more door kicking operations I, in a densely populated area like that. I guess the point I was trying to make uh, or was, was trying to arrive at is I, I'm obviously biased in this. I, I'm no yeah. fan of American operations at all. I've been incredibly critical of my entire, you know, professional media career of, of the war crimes that America is engaged in. Yep. However, as far as like uh, America's operations in the region, um, it seems to me like the restraints are so far removed at this point, so unshackled in Israel's day-to-day operations in Gaza that it makes a lot of uh, even America's involvement in areas like Iraq and Afghanistan look restrained and tame in comparison, even though it certainly was not. Um, I think I think the, the drivers are different too. Like the kinds of, you know, like the, we didn't, we, you know, it, it took us years to like, to like get into, you know, this, the mode of, of being able to like conduct operations in Afghanistan, even though it was like, I think it was like December that we started to conduct operations, but like real on the ground operations didn't really start until early 2002. And then, um, you know, you know, there's all, I wasn't a, I was a, I was a teenager. So like, I, like the whole weapons of mass, mass destruction debate is a little outside my wheelhouse. Uh, personally, um, obviously I have opinions in this area, like whenever it comes to like Bush's, uh, invasion of, of Iraq, but the invasion of Iraq happened like two years after nine 11, you know, and, uh, and then it turns out that it has absolutely no connection to the initial attack. So I think that the speed with with, with which the, and, and the, the ferocity of which this this has been done has sort of led to um, has, sort, has sort of led to uh, led led to a kind of it's led to operations that I think would be in viewed in comparison as more hasty, right? Like you know, objectively, these are hasty. These are more hasty operations being conducted. Now and then, they have a lot more information. Like, their information, because they've... they've yeah, they have round-the-clock the surveillance exactly. over the course of... Uh, I mean, Israel is a belligerent occupier in this circumstance, and they have round-the-clock surveillance that uh, that has been ongoing and consistent uh, since 2005, and far beyond uh, before that as well. Um, and uh, so, therefore, as the belligerent occupier, they, they have... Uh, certainly the capabilities of, of dealing with this, mm-hmm. uh, even if they want to in a, milita- uh, in a military fashion, dealing with this in a much more restrained way. It's just that I think that uh, many Israeli leaders have said time and time again that uh, Hamas is a gift for them so that they can uh, consistently uh, tighten the grip they have over Gaza or even engage in sieges that they consider mowing the lawn operations over mm-hmm. and over again. And we've, you know, and they've, done this, some, they, they've yeah. done this a n- number of times, like 2009. You know, of course, to, never to this too. severity. Yeah. Yeah. Is, I, yeah. The, the, I mean, also like the, the number of eyes on this is, is dramatically different. Yeah. Like the amount of, and I've like, one of the things that I've noticed in warfare since since I, you know, since 2000, since the 2000s, whenever I was like, you know, uh, working in the U.S. military, is the amount of information that the public has, um, which is dramatically different. Like people often like ask me like about the the secrecy versus uh, transparency debate, and we're now in an age of radical transparency where you know information flows very quickly, and you can sort of see this, and so it's it's yeah. shifted the it's shifted the the it's shifted the way of because you can't really hide. 
the fact that you are doing these kinds of operations. So what you do is now, now you have you have a, a massive incentive because it's cheaper to just disincent is to just spread disinformation, spread propaganda. Yeah. And I, I think that that and you know the the social you know social media, mobile phones. Uh, and the ability of anybody to sort of on, on certain platforms to sort of take part in a debate or to engage in, in a debate has incentivized sort of like state actors to, when they're conducting, you know, whenever they're conducting, you know, uh, you know, oh, things that could be viewed as misdeeds, that their their incentive is to entice people to share uh, false information, misinformation, yeah. disinformation. Oh, and and um, Russia did this uh, quite frequently in its invasion of Ukraine, of course. Yeah. And, and, and Ukraine did to an extent. And, and Ukraine did as well. Yeah. Yes. In order to keep up like the, in order to, I guess, like better position themselves or, or to yeah. showcase it's that an, they were doing a lot better. It's information warfare type environment yeah. that we live in. Uh, it's not, and nothing is local anymore. Like the, like every, every combat operation that's going to take place between major powers in the few, for the next, for the next dec for the next few decades, at least is going to be uh, one that involves the entire world. Right. It's going to be a social media debate. It's going to be a fight over, over the truth and what the information is, as opposed to like whether or not, you know, something is being hidden from you. Cause it's not be like uh, information gets out now. It just, it, you can see yeah. it. Like you can see the footage, you can see it right, right then and there. But now there's like sort of, sort of this effect of people um, like debating about reality and what is true. And, and you sort of pick sides, you pick a team. And I, it, it, like, I've seen this happen. I saw this happen um, with the protests in 2010. Uh, I saw this happen with, um, you know, sort of the, the, uh, I saw this happen with uh, the war and um, we saw this with COVID, like sort of COVID denialism, yeah. uh, the election denialism. We've seen this with um, the in, with the invasion of uh, of Ukraine by Russia. Yeah. And uh, it's we, we've we and this is just an extension of that. But the resources involved, you know, with with uh, with the United States and uh, Israel and other, and other allying powers is, is that they have a, an immense ability to like, you know, to disincentivize people or to like have people cut t cut ties with you know people who 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 say what the you know what the objective reality is and that's one one of the most shocking and one of the most uh, alarming things that I've sort of noticed um, so I was in Europe for the last month I basically spent m most of the last 2 months in Europe and so I was there in Berlin whenever the the protests were sort of whenever protests sort of start, started to pop off and the 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 swiftness with which um, the police forces uh, and the the state apparatus sort of like went to engage with that like was very fast and was very intense uh, and it was and, and this is like this is this is like in Europe right so it has this Europe Europe in the United States has this perception of being like a, a sort of like free speech free, haven free kind of speech haven liberal Western liberal exactly. democracy and uh, and then I, I saw this again in London like another weekend uh, went by and uh, and the, this was the one where the, the 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 I think Home Secretary got sacked for trying to get the 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 police uh, forces to oh, yeah. to crush the the protests yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah, we're living in a we're living in a time where information gets out, and then there's like a, a there's like an incentive is to just like crush people to, for for speaking out and for sharing information. There and are it's alarming. There are certainly a lot of uh, disinformation merchants that are uh, out and about on, and I hate to be the both sides guy, but mm -hmm. you know, literally on on both sides. It the difference, of course, I would say is that the disinformation. Uh, doesn't come from a centralized force on the Palestinian side because they do not have like a propaganda outlet that is effective because they have nothing in comparison to the Israeli side where there is, of course, uh, where there is, of course, a, a massive, uh, openly well-funded Hasbara operation. And despite all that, what I will say, what I do find very strange is that looking at what Ukraine did mm -hmm. in such a short period of time, as far as disinfo goes, right. looking at what Russia did uh, and has done and has continued to do uh, over the course of many, many years that they put a lot of effort into, it's shocking how bad Israel's Hasbro operations have been. And I think that there is a weird, like, there is this, there's this weird parallel that I, I think you can draw on uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, when we're talking about arrogance, yeah, 
Because I think that the reason why Israel, for example, thinks it can get away with the Pallywood conspiracies, mm-hmm. right? The the notion, for those of you who don't know, that uh, Palestinians are simply faking it, like that that they're not actually having their children I, I be destroyed. People arguing this, yeah, yeah, like Jerusalem Post is, you know, it's it's a right wing actors. It's a right wing uh, paper for the most part, but like the fact that a official. Israeli newspaper by the name of Jerusalem Post uh, came out with an article that said this was a doll. This like uh, Al Jazeera was was uh, uh, censoring a, uh, a Palestinian father holding up a doll, and it wasn't a real baby. Was a disgusting, uh, disgusting form of propaganda that I think average onlookers will look to and go, "What the fuck? Why?" Like we can see it with our own two eyes what the devastation that you've caused in Gaza. I don't think the Palestinians need to make up. Uh, more severe war crimes that you are actively championing and and openly stating that you're doing and even, you know, showing that you're doing. Um, And yet it still was something that uh, they went along with until Jerusalem Post came out and apologized for it. Why do you, why do you think uh, they're so bad at propaganda? What would would incentivize them to, to look, you know, to like do their homework and to like come up with a, with a, with a more like, uh, a complex plan, right? I think you know, more which, so this stuff. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's it's the 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 biggest problem that they sort of have is they're is they're suffering from success, really, right? You know, they've been able to sort of do whatever they've wanted to do, and so they they don't they don't have the incentive to like to like you know to to you know. Nobody's ever really countered them in a in a significant way. I think it first started in 2014. Like we saw this, like it was the first time that West, the sort of like Western states, that sort of been like, "Hey, wait a second, what's going on?" Right? And because it like, really peaked in 2021. Yeah, which was a turning point when it you scared, saw it scared the IDF. It scared yeah. the it, it scared um, you know the the Israeli intelligence services for sure. But I don't think that they. I think that they they are they're, they're like they're it's a suffering from success meme where they've just sort of like they've assumed that they don't need to do that uh, and, and to have something that 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 is uh, that is extremely effective anymore. Yeah. Um, no. It's like it's like Henry Kissinger. Everybody talks about how trying, wonderful they're trying now to like to like adjust triangulate. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're adjusting their, their tactic. I mean, one of the things that I've heard is that, um, they're bringing people to, um, to, uh, think tanks right now. They're grabbing people from think tanks and from, uh, senior university fac- uh, faculties to view, um, to view videos of footage from October 7th, for instance. Oh yeah. So that's been like the major, uh, that's been, I think the most powerful form like of, of propaganda is to just like show October seven over and over again, and recycle that, yeah, so that they can continue. And, it, and uh, to be and to be clear, you know, like uh, you know, the, to, to you know, it's a, it's it's become sort of a meme at this point. Like you know, condemn violence and condemn you know the yeah, the attack. of course, uh, yes, you know. So I I don't want to I don't I don't want to discount that. I mean, it's but you, there's a there, there is a there, there is a point where you know it's the Clausewitzian sort of like reciprocity and the 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 principles of you know proportionality and I and you know the 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 idea. Like the the thing that worries me and that alarms me the most is that I don't know what their end state goal is, right? Because they say one thing and that they, they keep moving that goalpost. Like first they say they're only going in the northern part and now they're going into the southern part. Like when does this, you know, how far does this go? And I, you know, that I think that's the thing to keep to keep an eye on as things progress because I think that this is like. This is going to continue for quite some time. There, there is, there, there's no indications from 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 where I'm sitting that you know uh, that that uh, Israel is. Um, what was is it? Just two going years? In and out. Uh, I think it was literally. Was it? Was it this? Hold on. Um, no, it wasn't this. But I, I've years, seen. Yeah. No, no, no. It wasn't even that. That's uh, that's like hunting down the Hamas operatives or yeah. Hamas leadership in other foreign countries. Uh, but no, there there has been. Um, there have been so many different talking points about how long this will take. Oh, we're not interested in annexation. Uh, we actually want to just eradicate Hamas. And then, oh, this war will only wage on until we finish Hamas, until we finish the job. I do or, think, or even like it'll it'll take a couple months. Like I do think that I do think that they have a, they must understand that they have uh, that they have a clock ticking in terms of what they can do before. 
uh, finally, you know, European, Western European, Western European countries, and you know, countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, start to question that. And, and obviously, you know, uh, a NATO member uh, spoke out today uh, with uh, Erdogan, yeah, but but, but, but that's like he has a position. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked about like a lot of. I think that Australia and England uh, are are more significant than uh, than Turkey is. But obviously, the big player in the room that can shut this off, shut the violence faucet off tomorrow if they wanted to, is America. I, I it wouldn't be without retort and maybe even some violence directed in our direction. I would even go so far yeah. as to say that potentially, judging by what Israel has done in the past. I mean, uh, however, uh, Turkey has no say in the matter, and they have been a regional uh, ally to Israel, offering material support to Israel, and also, uh, you know, a lot of the oil that goes into Israel directly goes through Turkish pipelines yeah. that pass through from Azer Azerbaijan to Turkey to Israel. So, of course, uh, it's all just a show for his own uh, audience, and I liken it to the, the Gulf Nation leadership, like the, the genuine uh, interest that Gulf leaders, uh, Gulf Nation states have in having, you know, security contracts with America, aligning with America, getting F-16s and the like, while simultaneously, like, the populations are obviously pro-Palestine, so they have to, like, um, play this song and dance. Um, however, it does seem like, um, I think, some some semblance of permanent occupation is is uh, going to be what's going on. I mean, they're blowing up the government buildings. Like, they, you don't do that. You don't blow yeah, up the, civil the society and, 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 and uh, ministries unless you're... But they did that in Beirut in the 1980s, and they never fully occupied, so... I mean, well, I was about to say, well, I remember another country that blew up all the ministries, and it, with the exception of, uh, I, I guess, uh, energy. <laughs> I guess, with the exception of energy. And, and that, you could I was tell... In a, I, was in a, I was in an Iraqi Ministry of Defense building that we just called the JDAM building. Yeah. you could just walk through, and then in the middle, there was a, just a... You could see uh, in one of the rooms, you could go up and see the... Yeah, so the it, that goes to show that, like, there is no real... Uh, there's no real interest in, like, rebuilding a country uh, uh, at all or even allowing it to exist as an autonomous uh, uh, region if... Uh, I mean, you know, looking at America's yeah. involvement in the in the area and looking at Israel. Yeah, I do. I just, I just do. I do think that there is some some real. I think I think that the the more realistic folks in the particularly the the IDF, not necessarily the the the, mini, the ministerial leadership or anything like that, but I think that some of them must fully understand that there's a time limit to how much how, how long they conduct can, can conduct this before they start to to see the effects of the the, the pipelines of of you know, fuel of weapons, you know, cause it's, it's like, there's only, and also like, there's a short, like they're, they're asking for things that there are shortages of in the world. Right yeah. Now, you know? Well, the one, the one partner that's getting uh, cooked in this entire thing is Ukraine. It seems yeah. where the American leadership it's drawn has a lot said, of attention away from it. Yeah. Uh, the American leadership has openly stated that uh, there is a end to the unlimited funds that Ukraine has received thus far. Yes. That uh, by the end of this year, unless Congress acts, we just simply don't have any more money in the couch cushions for Ukraine, any more weapons in the couch cushions for Ukraine. So that's one thing that came out earlier today. That was a big news story. And then, of course, on the propaganda side, obviously people are no longer as interested in what's going on in Ukraine. That, of course, came as a consequence of the counteroffensive failing as well, or at yes. least being considered an abject military failure uh, and, and nowhere near as... It wasn't like, successful. It was not. No, no. Uh, it's it's turned into a state like Ukraine. As, as, I, as I as I as I said in 2022, I you know it like they it wasn't a, they were not like the Russians trying to invade and take over the entire country was never going to happen. But they certainly have been able to cause a stalemate in the the four the four um you know sort of I forget what they're called like they're the county equivalents. Uh, oh, uh, oblast. Oh, oblast. Yeah. LPR, the, DPR, and, yeah, exactly. and like so most the, of uh, they're no longer republics. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so I don't know where that goes. I mean, do you, do you have any, um, I don't know. I told you like we could potentially talk about Ukraine as well, but you said like, you know, you're, you're more read up well, on, there, you know, it, I, I did a little reading up on, on, on Ukraine this morning and it's just, it's, it's been stalemate, you know, yeah. we've been in stalemate one for the, a year, about a year and a half now. One of the things that I was like, mentioning, apart from Bakhmut and, um, I think that, uh, um, the, 
I forgot. I, I did, like if you don't if you don't if you don't read up on this stuff like constantly, like you start to forget some of yeah. the names. Um, the U.S. could soon run out of money to send weapons to Ukraine if Congress does not approve additional emergency funds. The White House has said. Um, I think that we always. Would you say that this is an accurate assessment? I'm going to ask you a question. Where, um, America always has like it's like emergency oil reserves. Like we always have like emergency weapons. No, no, no. I'm saying like we always have like some some extra bombs that we can like always find under the couch cushions that we can deliver hastily over without like too much, uh, you know, congressional interference. All right. That we have been basically shipping over now to Israel yeah. rather than Ukraine. And that's yeah, the, the reason the, why the reserve I think stockpiles. I mean, like, uh, I, I have certainly, there's, there's only so many, there's only so many munitions that you can, that you can, that you can generate, that you can ship out. Like here's, here's the reality that, I think is geopolitically significant, like globally. And that is that when you have major wars, like, like, like the Russia, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when you have, uh, um, you know, Israel, when you have is Israel sort of, uh, um, you know, bombing campaign in, in Gaza, uh, and, you know, invade and inv invasion there, there's only so many weapons that, and so many, more importantly, ammunition. There's only so much ammunition that you can produce and still maintain a peacetime economy. So at some point, something I, ha I has to give, either you have to end operations or you have to slow operations down, or you have to start, you know, doing con conscription, <laughs> start nationalizing, you know. Uh, well, I think uh, Ukraine already did that, no? Yeah. And I feel like they already burned through. But like, I mean, globally, like if you're depending oh, yeah. on, on sort of the global <laughs> economy, like, you know, one, one of the worst, one of the worst effects that could, that could come out of the sort of geopolitical instability of the last three or four years is that we could see more economies that are sort of reoriented towards, you know, a, a sort of. Uh, post, uh, like pre World War Two, like gearing up, you know, of of uh, and stockpiling of, you know, like where you're, you know, you're essentially like trying to, to like boost up your personnel numbers and get get your and, and start focusing on like what 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 reserves and, and things that you can get and also start shifting away from you know a consumer based economy to one of of, of wartime production. It, according to Zelensky, the shell supply to Ukraine has been slowed down by the Israel Hamas war. Yep. Um, ironic because like global problem too. Yeah, I mean they we we already were tapping into South Korean uh, resources from the jump. Like this was happening even before October seventh. So the fact that they, um, I mean this was inevitable. This was an inevitability. Ukraine is one running out of manpower to be able to hold weapons even, and uh, seemingly uh, Russia for one reason or another has like an almost endless supply of like. Uh, conscripts that they can throw into the murder machine and and um and that has become you know a, a major issue for ukraine as far as i understand like things that i've read on on uh on the ground operations from ukrainian forces this is like their major issue is that yeah. they're running out of one experienced uh soldiers and two uh, you know there's only so much you can do when they just have a lot more people yeah. like they have a lot more people that they will throw into uh, positions to just like hold it. And I guess like one of the things I've talked about from the jump that uh, got a lot of criticism from um, pro NATO, uh, pro NATO uh, YouTubers, yeah, if you will. And many others was that I, I kept talking about the Min Minsk agreements and okay. like reinforcing the Minsk agreements, or at least the 15 point uh, potential peace plan that was uh, talked about in in Turkey that fell apart. And this yeah. was like fairly early on. Yeah. And I think that ultimately we are going to inevitably arrive at, with America's backing, maybe not that exact same plan, but something similar to that, where if Zelensky has to maneuver through this process, he's going to have to make concessions that, that involve, I would say, passing the buck, like the, the Crimea yeah. question, 15 years into the future or like somewhere in the future yeah. that he doesn't have to immediately take it up uh, to a vote yeah. because you know, that's not obviously the Ukrainians are going to say fuck no to that overall. And well, and they've, they've considered it. They've, you know, um, yeah. there's been, you know, like certainly in late 2022, like I think the, the Zelensky government at least, you know, sort of was exploring like what, like what, what a, what an agreement would look like, you know? Cause like, I, you know, like, there's only so many. There's there's only so many like there's there's only so much war that you can have. Like it's you can't constantly 
have battle after battle after battle, right? You know, and like maintain like the kind of society that you that, that you are able to continue to have. You know, whereas Ukrainian society it, like hasn't like the, like they've made an enormous amount of si- sacrifice in terms of like like defending their their positions. I, yeah. I I don't know if they're willing. I don't know how willing Ukraine is to do this for fifteen years. Right? Yeah, and I and I, and I don't. I'm, I Russia is obviously teetering on the brink, so they're very willing to do that. And I do, I just don't. I I don't know. And uh, I think that uh, you know eventually at some point the stalemate is going to break. Either you know, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen either because of political reasons, because the political will on either on one of the sides has 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 gone away, or there just isn't enough resources and logistics to maintain the 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 civilian population of of your respective country. Yeah, I think that overall the most i think like if we're gonna look at a list of like likely scenarios here the absolute worst one that i foresee that i've talked about from literally the first day of the russian invasion is that um hyper like ultra nationalist right-wing forces that have been seen understandably as like the emancipatory forces in the region yeah are going to have a lot more space to maneuver politically and will if they see Zelensky uh, concede to the Russian invaders will be able to uh, either under the watchful eye of the United States well nothing really happens without the United States knowing about yeah. it but uh, will will be able to um, create a massive opposition maybe even terror with US arms that they now have and control and with the US logistics and support that they have had for a very long time in their uh, battle against uh, the Russian invaders, they will now be able to turn those crosshairs on to not necessarily the Ukrainian public, but like Ukrainian officials and gain prominence and power within Ukraine, yeah. making the situation uh, really, really damaging for the civilian population. Yeah, and there's no way that you can contain that regionally, I don't think. Like yeah. That becomes, because of the information environment that we have with the internet and with social media, I, th- I think that like those, that becomes... That becomes a regional problem very quickly, like especially, oh, yeah. especially when if you have refugees and you ha- when you have uh, people who have fled the you know who have fled Russia, people who have fled uh, Ukraine, people who and and the the, the sort of intense, um, I, w- I don't want to say exhaustion of you know Eastern European uh, of Eastern European states because there's definitely a lot of. Uh, a lot of interest in supporting Ukraine. It, there's a lot of interest in supporting, but like yeah. there's that 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 only goes for so long, and that there might be a sense of like betrayal among, you know, people who had staunch support at one moment, and then that's that support sort of waning because of the, the there's only so much capacity that people have to 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 help in that situation. And then Ukraine, um, U- U- Ukraine, I think is has lost a little bit of political capital, um, in, in the fact that it, 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 it's been shown to be, uh, sort of, a, you know, one of the actors that involved in the, 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 the pipeline, uh, attacks. Oh, oh, the, yeah. More extreme attacks. Yeah. No, there's like, so like there's a lot, a lot of, of central European countries to be like, I don't know. Yeah. There's a, there is definitely a lot of like expenditure of political capital that they had as they, went far beyond the boundaries of what the American uh, state would allow them to in a sense where like when there's supposed to be 100% support for the actions of Ukraine, you even saw the American state department openly publicly criticize Ukrainian forces time and time again, the Nord stream uh, it it pipeline explosion, in my opinion, still of course had like an American signature in it. uh, But publicly it's, um, it's definitely, I would say publicly. Personally, I, I don't think the U.S. knew. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. I think they. I think that they. I think that they uh, that slipped through the cracks. But that's my personal opinion. That's, I, I, that's I my think personal it, opinion. I think Just, more so it's like stuff like um, they were like, oh, blowing shoot. up the Crimean Bridge yeah. and like things of that nature that or um, targeting like civilian areas that are uh, like Russian, uh, Russian uh, areas where like civilians live, yeah. like. I, I remember I reading time piece, and time yeah, again. I like the, I think they had the pieces to put that together, but didn't. Yeah. Well, regardless, it's just, uh, it was ridiculous that from the jump, America was like trying to piece it together by being like, oh, Russia must have blown it up themselves. And then like yeah. that in and of itself, I think kind of shows that America maybe wasn't as involved with that because like if they were, they would have probably had better counter propaganda immediately yeah. ready to go than uh, but the U- uh, Russia but, did it. But one thing that I noticed <laughs> is that the UK was pretty quiet. 
So I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, that could that could definitely. I mean, <laughs> the UK after the United States has been incredibly bloodthirsty in like constantly championing endless conflict in this in this region. So ultimately, though, I I don't know where this goes. Like I said, the worst case scenario is like uh, Zelensky tries to be the guy who negotiates a uh, American backed uh, settlement here. Um, I don't know what the what the country lines look like. Uh, it, it, with respect to like all the positions that Russia has advanced into Ukraine now, if there is even a return to like a Minsk style autonomous region for LPR, DPR, or if Russia will continue a permanent annexation, which I think is understandably a non-starter for Ukrainians. Like why the fuck would they allow that to happen? That's completely unacceptable. What about, what about uh, like the, we've, we've talked about, we've talked about Israel, Palestine. We've talked about Ukraine and Russia. What about, uh, the, the United States and China in this, because like the geo, because like I feel like all of this is connected, like globally, mm-hmm. as a part, like because these are like these are sort of like poles, and they're all just sort of like lining up in in, in terms of uh, of of positions. Like what what like what like what about? Well, I the- think that there is no better time for China to just take over Taiwan than now. If they were, but they're the manufacturer of the world's chips of like the game, yeah. the, your your uh, graphics cards over here. Are no, I know. Didn't didn't the USA department say something at Nvidia like literally today? Hold on, let me see if I can find it. Um, let's see. And AI is yeah. Heavily- look, look, they did fourteen yeah. hours ago. US issues warning to Nvidia, urging. Uh, Nvidia shut, gets shut a on. gets a yeah. warning from the U.S. Commerce Secretary. Uh. If you redesign a chip around a particular cut line that enables them to do AI, I'm going to control it the very next day, says the U.S. Commerce Secretary. I guess it's not so much uh, about China, but instead about uh, about AI specifically. Yeah, it's become a security issue. It's become a national security issue. Yeah. Um, you know, it was before it was a consumer device issue. Now that you know, with the the generative AI boom and you know uh, a new like the the ability to fly the the, the ability to fly and run vehicles. Uh, around the horizon uh, autonomously in, a, in you know military vehicles and and to be able to make decision making uh, uh, on the ground like uh, the gospel is what you're referencing right like exactly the, the Israeli targeting system it's insane like it's become a national security issue and uh, it's become a national sec- it's become a security issue for everyone right and all like ninety percent I think ninety percent of the world's like best chips are made in Taiwan so like that's and that I feel like all of this is can like personally I think all like everybody wants me to talk. Like everybody, like when they're asking about, about stuff, they they want to talk talk about a specific region. But like, I'm just looking at the at, I'm looking at the global powers like move like move like pieces on the board like before something like before bigger stuff happens, and that's the thing that has me the most alarmed. So what do you what do you think about the Xi Jinping uh, Brandon uh, conversations that took place recently in America? I mean, he, he yeah. came to San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, shouts out the gruesome governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, who who uh, seems to be uh, seems to have a decent relationship with Xi? Yeah. Um, but uh, he came. I think that they basically reinforced their position. Where America, I would say, well, took a pos- much more tempered approach. Where they said, you know, one China, we're not. Yeah, that's all. That's been the policy. Yeah, which has been the policy. Strategic ambiguity. But China, in opposition to that, very openly said, it does not matter what America's interests are. Taiwan and China will be reunified no yeah. matter what, which is like a pretty hard line to take and then also still continue having like yeah. a, a show of of peace with the Biden administration. What do you make of that? So I think that China is in a stronger negotiating position uh, these days because they have – because the, like the Malacca Strait has been extremely important strategically for them. Mm-hmm. And now the infrastructure and the investments that they've made with the Belt and Road Initiative, which has been – it's been hit or miss in some places. But I think that the Belt and Road Initiative has put them into a position where they have more of st- – where in the future, not right now, but in the, in the coming years, they have more strategic security – from you know having from being able to have their their uh, you know oil cut off like in 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 a situation where the U.S. Navy were to you know like blockade the Malacca Strait or the Strait of Hormuz, mm-hmm. so you know I th- I think that and also like 
the the China China recognizes that the U.S. that the U.S.'s ab- uh, ability to to maintain its like technological superiority is now like heavily weighted on the ability to produce chips to produce like like three like three like three nanometer pr- uh, produced chips and I think that Taiwan uh, obviously has you know <clears throat> positioned itself to be the manufacturer of that nobody whenever whenever it looked like think the world was sort of settling and, and, and peaceful you know it looked like ta- <coughs> Taiwan made a lot of sense and I think that now China recognizes that like that's closer to to ta- to the time ta- that the island of Taiwan is is closer to China than it is the United States. And, you know, how invested, especially whenever the U S has been involved in global affairs for decades now, like for decade after decade. And I think that the, they're, they're reading the tea leaves that the United States is really tired. The United States, like uh, the populate, the American pot, the American population doesn't really have the same sort of appetite for engaging in, uh, in, in engaging in like for in, in like foreign affairs anymore. I mean, I don't even know if they have the smoke. I can't believe I'm saying this, but, like, I do feel as though we we have finally arrived at an age where, like, yeah, we have 800 military bases that we know and of. And the, the conservatives but, know that. But even then, it feels like um, American forces are spread too thin in so many, in numerous conflicts. With, like, Zoomers are not signing up. And, and regional actors... Um, regional power players like Russia, like even Turkey, as a matter of fact, or China, which is, you know, beyond a regional power player, but as acting as a regional power player um, has been able to make moves in, in a direction that certainly doesn't favor American hegemony. And it seems like every time there is a new front opening up in a, in an endless sea of proxy wars, we are for the first time ever without a World War II style like command economy that is fully focused on war are unable to produce the necessary munitions to keep this up. That's why you see uh, Ukraine and and Israel playing hot potato on like who gets to be the, who gets to be the one that America is like backing the most. Because, you know, you can print money endlessly, but ultimately you still need commerce. Yeah, we have been doing that, (laughs) of course, but you still need to, you still need like an industrial engine to back that up. And and it's not centered in the US anymore. Yeah. So so I don't know. I I, I it's I now, feel now the like, global south is where a lot of the industry is. Yeah. And the production capabilities are. So what do we what do we do in this situation? I don't know. And it, it's like, look, China is saying there will be a peaceful reunification. Uh, no matter what happens. I think I think that they I think that they that my personal opinion. My personal assessment is that China is that China doesn't want uh, an open conflict so close. No, to their, I I don't think so. Yes. I think that I think that they want to go up against the United States, but they want to go up the, against the United States while still having a a, a commercial p- partner, an economic partner, and you know that like they're they're uh, they want they just want like regional, they want regional like control yeah. that doesn't have U.S. interference. Yeah, one hundred percent. And the U.S. is not in a position to like counter that right now. Well, the U.S. isn't in a position to counter that in the only way it knows, unfortunately, which it is like completely ships. abandoning soft yeah. power and yeah. like, like offering Japan unprecedented militarization opportunities and like putting as many fucking missile bases as yeah. possible in a in a circuit of islands that like directly point them in uh, in the vicinity of China in the direction of China, which uh seems not great it's not a good it's not a good thing to do obviously but it's also i i don't know i just um i mean it, a conversation that they had was actually towards denuclearization obviously it's not going to happen but like china as a counter to that has also really beefed up as far as i understand its nuclear armaments Right, as and a negotiating, yeah, thing. as as a as a uh, way to what, say what's like the Hassan rule, yeah, nuclear <laughs> proliferation is a necessity. The Hassan Abi doctrine: <laughs> get nukes, and if America suspects you of having nukes or claims you have nukes, drop everything and get the nukes. Right? Yeah. So that's what China has been doing, and China was the leader in that conversation against America, saying we want to put a halt to the nuclear proliferation, but you also have to demilitarize this region that you have been greatly beefing up South China Sea. Yeah, in the South China Sea and and it seemed like America was was um interested in in 
conceding, but I mean, what America says and what America does, especially yeah. with China, are two think, different things. I think. I mean, it was just. I've just noticed a lot of the rhetoric, right? I've just noticed that like there's been a pump up of like of like rhetoric, you know, whenever it comes to to um, whenever it comes to like the the United States, like just just has just been engaging in more rhetoric, even whenever at the same time, like they're still inviting Xi to over to like you know, to speak, right. And to like have, to, to like have West coast, uh, you know, um, luncheons. Right. Yeah. Um, but overall the, the, like, what was that? Trade what was that did, did, uh, was it Biden? That, was, was it Biden? That somebody called him a dictator recently. Was it Biden? It was Biden. Yeah. It was Biden immediately after Xi had left in a press conference where they were like, so do you think Xi's a dictator? And he's like, yeah, Xi's a dictator. And then you, and then you watch Blinken's POV on that, and he's like, "Oh fuck! Like, oh no! Like, what are you doing?" So what? What hap- What what happens next year? Well, Biden is is has played fast and loose with uh, its its uh, involvement with China like time and time again throughout his uh, presidency, where you do chalk it up to him being senile over and over again. I think Chi- I think Chinese leadership understands that. Yeah, like it's less of a. Like a madman theory, Nixon style, like madman theory, and more like literally delirious old man theory. Yeah, where Brandon's uh, diplomacy is is more akin to like late stage Ronald Reagan, late stage Alzheimer's Ronald Reagan, where he's just like kind of saying whatever the fuck comes to mind, and then everyone's like, "Okay, I'm so sorry he said that." So I'm I'm gonna close this out with a question to you. All right, like, tomorrow, like next year, 2024, mm-hmm. it's an election year. Why does it feel like this election cycle just doesn't have as much energy as like previous election cycles? I think everyone is so tapped out. They don't it, it's it's being positioned as like a Trump versus Brandon, uh, you know, uh, election cycle. Donald Trump has a litany of crimes that he has to address in the American criminal justice system, which will be interesting to follow through on. But like even he's more low energy than he has been. Yeah. Because when Trump first came out swinging, everything he's just a grievance, and he's just yeah. a grievance machine. Like I don't, I don't hear but, like but when you he heard first, in twenty sixteen, like it, he would say things that would resonate with with the yeah. with his audience. But now he's just like, like I'm the most, uh, you know, the most oppressed president ever. He had a very good way of connecting yeah. like his own personal grievances with what he understood was the grievances held by. Maybe it was a misdirection, but the grievances yeah. that people thought they had with, like, elites, right? Now, after four years of Donald Trump and four years of Joseph, Robin, and Brandon... He has less riz. He, he has very... He has much less riz. On the Democratic Party side, we have nothing. Like, uh, I mean, Biden is the only person that's, like, less popular in his own party than Donald Trump is in his own party. And it's crazy... Uh, it, it's crazy, but like I think a lot of young people have completely tapped out. They see yeah. it. They 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 noticed maybe in uh, during COVID yeah. and during the Black Lives Matter protests, like they went out, they took it to the streets, they nothing protested, happened. and nothing came of that. So now they're like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Like this shit yeah. doesn't work. And they're probably experiencing that again. The ones who are going out and protesting for Gen Palestine, Alpha, yeah. yeah, like. Uh, it, it's just America and American politics is a is a is yeah, a one is, party this state. A, this is from a Democratic administration as well. Yeah, it's a one party state. It's yeah. just the unfortunate reality. Like the American government is going to do whatever it needs to do that it thinks is like the most compelling, most important things it needs to do. That's why you see Joe Biden continuing the uh, the wall. Yeah, even though he ran against it, um, there is obviously like some really good things that the the Biden administration has done, maybe not directed by Biden, but at least Biden has like gotten out of the way of the NLRB. Infrastructure bill. <laughs> and, and yeah, the IRA was decent. Like it's pretty good. Uh, all things considered. However, the same, the same, uh, economic considerations that the broader, uh, population had black and Brown people, uh, less educated populations, uh, people living in rural areas, like, these 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 conditions have not changed. We look at everything and mark it on uh, a a post COVID. Uh, we look at we look at it and we grade it on a curve where we look at like well post COVID like and pre COVID in comparison to twenty nineteen like the yeah. economy has recovered to twenty nineteen levels, forgetting that 
there inflation. was a reason. For, well, that, <laughs> but also forgetting that there, were, there was a reason why Bernie was so popular yeah. in 2016. Obviously, he was going up against Hillary Clinton, which was very unpopular. However, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren gaining any sort of prominence within the Democratic Party can only happen as a consequence of the volatility that people feel, the yeah. economic instability that people feel in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think we've completely lost track of that. Um, we've completely lost sight of that when we look at the economy and we grade it on like, well, post-COVID, we finally recovered. Yeah, so why are people still points, upset? They're looking at percentage points and not like the metrics of like how, of like people's ability to be able to uh, be upwardly mobile, to be able yeah. to, 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 the purchasing power of people has dramatically gone down. Right. And I, you know, like I felt this, right. You know, yeah. it's just like, it's just like people like things are more expensive. Um, your income hasn't really gone up for the vast majority of people, unless you're, unless you have like, unless you have stonks and you know, you have like a gazillion, like you have equities and mutual funds like yeah. up the wazoo. Like it's just like for the average person, like the price of milk is the, and the price of gas and the price of, um, yeah. you know, and, and, the, and, and the, it's not going to go down because like, yeah. you know, inflation is yeah, like, Getting a getting a grip on inflation doesn't mean that like prices go down. That would be deflation. So obviously there's like you know, people probably yeah. expect that to happen, but that's not but going to happen unless been the talking point of the administration, like the uh, for the for the election cycle has just been like, Oh, well the, um, you know, the, the economy's doing well. Like on paper, sure, but like you've 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 been adjusting those numbers for and, years. And also the economy is low. But also the irony is that like the economy is always doing well on paper yeah. since, I mean, in perpetuity. Since 2009. Yeah, the economy has been doing great since 2009. It's always on the up and up. It's always growing, explosive growth, yeah. except, except it's COVID never. Except COVID and like the. Yeah with, yeah, with minor blips. But my point is like, it doesn't really translate to how people feel about the economy. No. And it's weird because like, I think there was a point in time before COVID where like economists were trying to come to terms with the why. Yeah, it's not translating to, you know, people feeling like the economy is doing well. But now I, I feel like we've lost sight of that completely and and just grade on this like weird curve. Like it can't uh, help that we have FOMO every time we look at social media people. Yeah, I mean, sure, that might be a part <laughs> of it. But I do think that um, I do think that the most important things that people need to purchase for survival, uh, like the the uh the, the price of that going up steadily yeah. or the most important things for upward social mobility, like education, higher education being insanely unimaginably expensive healthcare, higher education and shelter are three of the most important things for both survival and also upward social mobility. Yeah. Those three things have no control. No, nope. there is, they are completely off the fucking rails with respect to affordability. And yet there's, you know, leaders are not, looking at that and saying we have to rein this in it's not just the egg prices not just the milk prices which are important yeah. certainly of course commodities are important like food but um these other things we have no interest in even trying to deal with and people are still experiencing um the the shocking price uh, uh the the expansion of prices on on those areas and you know, that's going to cause them to be very unhappy about the situation. All right. It's six minutes past the hour. All right. Yeah. I'm going to run the three minute ad break right there now, which the price of which has not changed. Thank you, Chelsea Manning, for coming Thank on. Thank you. Thank you. American so much. hero. Uh, Kaya has gotten so big, by the way. Like, yeah. Just, she just, is, she's just ginormous. a giant, gigantic doggo. Look at, like just look at the way she's standing right there. Yeah, like literally bigger than me. Yeah, she just like lays and chills all day like how, that. How 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 like how, how much does Hakaya weigh now? Like around ninety pounds, I think, close to ninety that's, pounds. That's almost as much as me. I weigh like one hundred and fifteen pounds. Oh yeah, no, she's well. We'll see what she might grow all even right. larger than you then. All right. Well. All right. Well, all right. thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right, everybody. Is there anything you want to promote before you leave? Is there anything you want to promote? Uh. So I think I want to promote. Uh, you know what? I think uh, I think I'm good. I think uh, I'm I'm just kind of keeping it low key and chill. I've you got a memoir? Uh, I do have a. Oh yeah, I have readme.txt. That's my memoir that came out. It's in pa paperwork back. Um, I, I I I haven't really been promoting it. It's also an audible. Like if if you're like me and you're lazy, um, and just you listen to uh, books at two uh, x, um, like like me, then uh, it's available as an audible, which took me like. 30 hours to record so in my hell yeah all right well all thank right. you so much Chelsea thank you